Chapter 4 of The Story of Geronimo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Parker. The Story of Geronimo by Jim Keelyard. Chapter 4. Again it was spring, the spring of 1858, and almost the entire village of Membreno Apaches was on the move. Twenty or more youngsters, who couldn't contain their own bubbling spirits and wouldn't restrain their lively ponies, led the main column by half a mile. Next, riding his immense war horse and surrounded by his sub-chiefs, came Magnus Coloradus himself, a giant of a man and a great leader. Immediately behind this group were more than three hundred pack horses and burros. Their packs bore tanned skins fruit of the saguaro cactus, edible roots of the mescal plant, and other trade goods. The pack train was guarded by warriors who rode on either side, far enough behind so that they would not be bothered too much by the dust of the pack train came the remainder of the warriors, the old people, and the women and children. All were mounted. Some of the smaller children rode four or five to a pony, they were going on a holiday of the happiest sort. Though the Apaches were usually at war with the Mexicans, they had arranged a peace so that they might have their great annual trading party, or fiesta, in Mexico. Most of the trading would be done in the town of Casas Grandes, deep in the Mexican state of Chihuahua. But before reaching Casas Grandes, they intended to stop and trade at a smaller town which they called Cascaya. Two and a half miles short of town they halted and set up camp. This was a simple enough business. Most of the Indians just cast their blankets down on the ground and arranged a fireplace. Some cut green saplings and thrust the thick ends in the ground to form a circle. Next they bent the tops together and held them with buckskin thongs. Then they thatched the walls with deer skins or blankets. Geronimo started building such a wiki up for his mother, Alope, and his three children. His two daughters, ten and five, and his seven-year-old son tried so enthusiastically to help him that the wiki up never would have been built if Alope hadn't taken charge. The Apaches had not stopped so far from Cascaya because they were afraid of the Mexicans. But, though Mexican women might roam at will in Apache villages, no Apache woman would think of showing herself in a Mexican town. Besides, trading was a man's business. Leaving enough warriors to protect a peaceful camp, the eighty men who were going in town to trade set out, led by Magnus Coloradus himself. They took only thirty horses, twelve of which were laden with trade goods. The rest of the trade goods and the pack horses and burros were saved for trading in Casas Grandes. Every warrior except Geronimo had a hidden knife. Some carried hidden pistols, and a few had carbines, or short rifles, thrust inside their breeches. To enter the town openly armed would surely provoke a fight, and a fight would spoil the holiday. But even though they were supposedly at peace, no Apache ever trusted any Mexican, and no Mexican ever trusted any Apache. Geronimo carried only a buckskin pouch filled with yellow metal that, to him, hadn't the slightest value. Made into arrow or lance heads, it blunted on almost any target. It was too heavy for hair or ear ornaments, and useless to the Apaches except as playthings for the children. But the Mexicans, who called the metal oro, gold, prized it greatly. The traders reached the sun-dried brick wall enclosing the town of Cascaya and found a squadron of rurales drawn in formation across the gate. All these soldier police were mounted and armed, and their snapping black eyes were filled with hatred for Apaches. As Geronimo knew, there was good reason for this hate. Apaches had raided too long, too often, and too successfully in Mexico to win any friendship from Morales, whose duty it was to stop them. Magnus Coloradus addressed the uniformed officer. Buenos tardes, señor Rurale. We would trade. 
The officer made an effort to stare Magnus Coloradus down, and when he couldn't do it, flushed angrily. But he replied civilly, Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, Senor Apache. You may enter. The rurales drew aside, let the Apaches through the gate, and then reformed across it. The Apaches braced themselves to meet the horde of peddlers that screeched and squawked down on them. Geronimo was confronted by a lanky man whose only garment was a tattered serape, or blanket-like robe, that was draped over one shoulder and pinned at the sides with thorns. His hair looked as though it hadn't been combed in years. His beard was as tangled. His body was dirty. His eyes were both cunning and humble. In sharp contrast were the fierce eyes of a golden eagle that the Mexicans had imprisoned in a wooden cage. In spite of broken and bedraggled feathers, the eagle still looked royal. The Mexican lifted the cage. See, si, he whined. See, si, Senor Apache, grieved though I must be to part with anything so precious, this noble bird is yours for only three horses. Geronimo brushed heartily past the man and walked on. The peddler called anxiously, Will you give me some mescal? Geronimo's eyes expressed his disgust. If wild things were not meant for the wilds, the god Usan would not have placed them there. They might be hunted for food, but never should be imprisoned. Some tobacco, the eagle's captor wailed. Geronimo turned, glared, and the Mexican scurried away. Geronimo continued his unhurried walk. Cascaya was truly remarkable. Largely, Geronimo thought, because so many people could live in such a small area. They were so crowded that Geronimo wondered how they kept from suffocating each other. He saw a man lying with his head on a chunk of adobe, the same sun-dried brick from which the town walls and all the buildings were fashioned. Suddenly the man leaped up and began to scream. Other Mexican men, women, even children at once started to scream or shout as loudly as they could. The clamor was deafening. The amazed Apaches halted and gaped. After a bit, assuring himself that this senseless yelling must be a sickness suffered by those who allow themselves too little room, Geronimo went on. Presently he halted beside a Mexican who had a basket supported by a ragged rope over one shoulder. The basket was divided into compartments and filled with glass beads that were separated according to color. The beads were so fascinating that Geronimo scarcely knew that the horrible din had quieted. He caught up a half dozen assorted beans and one by one put them back in the proper compartments. He took out his pouch of gold, but though he yearned for the beads and would gladly have given all his gold for them, he was too good a traitor to offer everything at once. Geronimo dropped two small nuggets into the palm of his hand and held them out. No, the bead vendor refused. But excitement made him breathe hard, and he could not take his eyes from the pouch. Geronimo gave him two more nuggets. The Mexican gasped, and Geronimo thought he was once more refusing. Recklessly, he poured half the gold into the bead vendor's palm. The Mexican moaned, slipped the basket from his own shoulder, and hung it on Geronimo's, cupped the gold with both hands, and ran. Geronimo dropped the still half-filled pouch of gold into the dust and forgot it. He noticed for the first time that his comrades were making their way towards the gate. Trading had been brisk. The Apache trade goods were gone, and each warrior had at least a double handful of knickknacks. The rurales drew their horses aside and let the departing Apaches through the gate. The Indians started back to their camp, but when they were halfway there, Magnus Coloradus halted suddenly. A split second later, every warrior was silent. From a brush-grown Araro, Ogoli, came the hushed voice of Pedro Gonzalez, one of those who had stayed behind. This way! The eighty melted into the Araro as quietly as eighty quail might slip away from an approaching hunter. They found Nadezi with Pedro. 
the wives of five of the men who had gone into town and the wives of four who had stayed behind were there also, and two girl children. The faces of all showed shocked, numb in grief, but the eyes of all, even the two children, blazed with fury. Some Urales came, Pedro snarled. I know not from where, but they outnumbered us two to one, and when we warriors would have fought rather than let them enter the camp, they reminded us that this is a time of peace. They said they wished only to trade and talk, but once among us they attacked without warning. We slew many, but our horses, our arms, our trade goods are now theirs. Of those men, women, and children who stayed behind, we alone live. Where are them rulers now? asked Magnus Colorados. In what was our camp awaiting your return? Pedro said. Magnus Colorado said, When Apaches do not make fools of Mexicans, the Mexicans seem determined to make fools of themselves. The Rurales must have known that some escaped and that we would be warned. They should have ambushed us as we left the gates of Kaskaya. Sadly, he thought of all those who had been killed. Then he added, I will take the wives of our brave men and these two children with me, and I will hold myself responsible for their safety. Of the rest, each seek a different path and hide his trail. We will meet at the place we have chosen to be our rendezvous. A moment later, the Araro was empty of Apaches. End of chapter 4